thank you, Chris, and thank you, Jay, and uh, thanks all of you for coming out today. I recognize a lot of uh, familiar faces, and you know a little bit about my background, but there are some uh, unfamiliar faces here as well. So first off, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, and then uh, about the issues in the campaign, and then specifically, uh, and uniquely, actually, uh, about Cape Cod, and how that plays into my uh, plans as being governor. So first off, I grew up in Westfield, Mass., it's exit three on the turnpike out near Springfield. Oh. And my dad went to trade school. Uh, my mom and most of her sisters only went to elementary school. So when I graduated from high school, I didn't go to college. Uh, I rolled up my sleeves, joined a union, and learned the value of a buck. And in doing so, I met a lot of good, hardworking, blue-collar people there who taught me that hard work and determination can more than make up for the lack of a college education. Um, they were making it. They were working their lives and making it. They were raising their families, paying their bills. Uh, they could afford a rent or a mortgage, and they could save for the future. Uh, I was working for them. Uh, I worked for my mom. I worked for my dad. So I had to make a decision. Is that a path that I wanted to follow down, and that was clearly working, or did I want to do something else? And I think this is part of the great joy in life. Um, we find out what our gifts and our talents are and what we like to do and what we do best, and we step forward, we test the waters. Uh, sometimes we don't get it right the first time, or most times we don't get it right the first time. We try again. This is our pursuit of happiness, not a government-imposed happiness. So I did that. I tested the waters. I went to college, uh, a two-year community college, and when I graduated, I transferred to WPI in Worcester and ended up earning graduate degrees in engineering and in management and then I worked as an engineer in Massachusetts. Um, long story short, I've been out of work and unemployed. You could read it on my, my push card, my campaign literature, a number of times. And four previous employers have closed their doors and moved, not closed their doors and gone out of business, closed their doors and moved out of state. That's one of the big reasons that I'm running. Um, the last time I was unemployed, about five years ago, I took a lien on my home, bought a small manufacturing business, and it has done so well. It's given me the opportunity to run for governor. Um, why governor? I do not want a political career. I've never been involved in politics before. I'm running to show that you can run and win in the blue state of Massachusetts as a conservative. And if I were to do that at a lower level state rep or something like that, it would not have the impact that I want it to have. I want to wake up the Republican Party here in Massachusetts. And if I were to win, I'd serve a term or two, then pass the baton to another uh, young conservative. <laughs> about the campaign, um, there are a lot of issues. I think they stem from one main issue, and that's this. Uh, do we fight for small government and individual freedom, or do we allow big government to get bigger and bigger and take over more and more of our lives? These two things, smaller government and individual freedom, are fundamental foundational pillars of the Republican Party. I'm a Tea Party member, but I am a Republican, a proud Republican, not afraid to be called one, not afraid to be associated with the Republican Party. I am a full platform, and no excuses necessary, loyal and proud Republican. That being said, we all know that this is a one-party rule state. The Democrats own it. And the choice that Republicans have in this primary, which is coming up September 9th, are two very different choices, very different choices. But they stem from the same fact, and that's the Democrats own the state. The traditional approach is this. Because they own the state, we really can't run as Republicans, especially not as conservatives. How do we appeal to the, you know, the liberals in Massachusetts and so forth and so on? So how has that played out? We saw how Senator Scott Brown, who won being right of center, moved left of center, lost his base, and lost the election. We saw how Senate candidate Gabriel Gomez, who pleaded with Deval Patrick for a position, who financially supported Barack Obama, and whose leftist leanings couldn't turn out 300,000 Republicans to vote for him. And he only lost by 120,000 votes. And then most recently, about a month ago, our state party leadership, the Republican leadership, honored uh, former Governor Bill Weld with the Lincoln Reagan Award. Now, former Governor Bill Weld not only financially supported Barack Obama, but he voted for Barack Obama over Republican John McCain. This is the state of our Republican establishment 
in Massachusetts, but it's not the state of those 300,000 who wouldn't go out and vote for uh, Gabriel Gomez. So the candidate, who's my opponent, uh, is in that camp. Uh, four years ago, he was frustrated that more people didn't understand that he's left, he was left with Barack Obama on issues. But now, he's gone even further to the left. Um, he has taken up Democrat positions. He believes that health care is a right. He believes that the pressing issues of the day are climate change, uh, income inequality, stricter gun control, uh, government involvement in the minimum wage, and most recently, that uh, Deval Patrick made the right decision on illegal immigration. That would certainly impact here down on the Cape. He's done all these things, but the thing he hasn't done, which his former boss, Governor Bill Well, did, and which former Governor Paul Salucci did repeatedly and was proud to do, and which I have done, is to take the no new tax pledge. So it's, un it's inconceivable that uh, you would think that Governor Deval Patrick has called him his identical twin. But because they line up so much on the issues, that's what he's done. He's called his identical twin. Eight years ago, Eight years ago, when Deval Patrick was considering running, he seriously considered Charlie Baker as his running mate. They were going to run a bipartisan ticket. And then when he did win eight years ago, Charlie Baker was on Governor Deval Patrick's transition team to help him into office. I want to be on the transition team to help him out of office. Okay. <laughs> That's the first approach. That's the first candidate that the Republicans, like yourselves, have to choose uh, a choice from in the, in the primary. The second one is not the same old. It's, I call it the new bold. Uh, and it stems from the same thing. The Democrats own the state. Yeah. But again, I say that's great, because that means they own all the problems, and they can't blame Republicans for anything. What a wonderful time. What a wonderful time to be a Republican if you run as one. The Democrats have pushed businesses, jobs, and people out of the state They've welcomed in illegal immigration. And all the candidates feel that they're on the right track. This is not the right track. This is the road to Detroit. We will fast become Detroit with this current situation. So the Democrats have had control in both houses on Beacon Hill since the 1960s. So what's happened? This is a big experiment. Has it been working well? If you think so, vote for it. If not, you can vote for me. What's happened in the last 50 years? In the 1960s, we had 12 congressional seats down in Washington. But because of driving people out of the state, 12 has become 11, 11 has become 10, 10 has become 9 most recently. If you read the U.S. Constitution, back in the 1770s, the Constitution only granted us 8. Democrat stranglehold in this state has pushed us back to the 1700s. Massachusetts is losing influence. Since Duval took office, the number of food stamp recipients has not gone up a little bit, it's doubled. According to the USDA, it was 450,000 when he took office. There are now over 900,000 food stamp recipients. I've been on transitional assistance. I know what, it, what it's for. It's for the needy. It's not for the greedy. If liberal Democrat policies were working so well, that number should be going down and down and down as people get more and more jobs. But it's going up and up and up. And the cost of the programs to serve them, the costs are tripled. Tripled. And not only tripling the cost for needy people, but a Democrat auditor has shown that there's $400 million in abuse and fraud and that we give EBT cards to 1,000 dead people. So again, I'm not for eliminating these programs. They're there, but not for the greedy. And then lastly, not because it's the last problem, but we have a certain amount of time, illegal immigration. Forget for a minute uh, the latest uh, you know, few months about unaccompanied minors. We have currently over 200,000 illegal immigrants in the state of Massachusetts. Oh, and it costs us each year over $2 billion, a billion with a B. Divide that number by all the cities and towns in Massachusetts, it amounts to about five, over $5 million each year. Local aid. You can use that for whatever you want. You know, your firefighters, your teachers, your police officers, or anything else you want. But it's taken from us and rewarded to those who break the law. That's the current state of things in Massachusetts. I mean, it's, it's, it's one thing to complain about them, but we need to offer solutions. So here are my solutions. With regard to joblessness, I have a four-point program to bring jobs back to Massachusetts. Government does not create jobs. We can make Massachusetts business friendly. How do we do that? First, we reduce the corporate tax. We make it comparable to those states to which we're driving businesses out. 
Secondly, we cut the overburdensome rules and regulations that do the same thing. I'll give you one quick example. A fellow that I know who owns a machine shop in Worcester County, a year ago he moved into a brand new facility. Brand new. Beautiful. The DEP, Department of Environmental Protection, uh, visited him. And they fined him $7,000. And he was happy it was only $7,000. But here was the issue. He had a sign on his wall that said, hazardous material. And they told him that's wrong. It should have said, hazardous waste. And rather than giving the 30 seconds to change it out, they slapped a $7,000 fine on him. I have more and more of those same types of horror stories. But this is what keeps businesses out of Massachusetts. Uh, the third point is this. We stopped the taxpayer funding of fad industries. What do I mean by that? A number of years ago, $58 million of your taxpayer dollars was used to support a company called Evergreen Solar in central Massachusetts. After taking your money, they closed their doors after just two years. They moved to China, and 800 people lost their jobs. 800 people lost their jobs. Lastly, we eliminate the inventory tax. It's a very obscure tax. Only about seven states have it. Massachusetts is one of them. What does it do? Right now, it keeps big distribution centers from coming to Massachusetts and taking advantage of our central location. You've heard the old adage in real estate, location, location, location. If you look at Massachusetts, where it's situated, right in the center of New England, three states to our north, two to our south, New York is to our left. They always want to keep New York to the left of Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> we eliminate the inventory tax. And Massachusetts is a magnet for distribution centers. Distribution centers come here and they bring material handling jobs, they bring logistics <coughs> jobs, they bring administrative jobs and transportation jobs, truck drivers in and out of Massachusetts. It would be a boom. I want to do for Massachusetts what Governor Scott Walker has done in Wisconsin. When he took over, in three short years, he took over with tens of billions of dollars in deficit. In just three short years, he's turned it into $1 billion surplus. $1 billion surplus. And when the unions came after him, and there were millions of dollars to get him recalled, Democrat voters, this is a blue state that voted for Obama, Democrat voters re-elected Governor Scott Walker by a wider percentage and a wider number of votes than they did the first time. Democrat voters like what conservatives are doing. They've elected conservative governors in the blue state of New Mexico, New Jersey, Wisconsin. We can do it here in Massachusetts. We've reached a tipping point. I think, well, I've said this before, we lost the Battle of Bunker Hill because we ran out of ammunition. But we lost political elections recently as Republicans because we haven't used all this ammo that I just talked about. We haven't had candidates with the willingness, resolve, or the backbone to make the Democrats own up to the problems they own. That's how we win elections, not by surrendering and becoming like them. So I would invite you to uh, consider me for this November 9th primary. Uh, let's reject the same old. Let's vote for the new bold. Let's be proud to be Republican again. Let's win again. With regard to Cape Cod, uh, quick story. I was at a uh, campaign event, uh, talking with a number of people, working through the crowd. And a fellow called me over and he said, OK, if you're elected governor, what are you going to do for me? And it took me back a little bit because it was a Republican crowd. You know, I might expect that from a Democrat crowd, but <laughs> these are Republicans. And I said to him, I'm going to give you back as much of your money so you get to decide what's the best thing for you to do. And the fellow next to me said, yeah, don't you remember what John F. Kennedy said? Ask not what your country can do for you. I use that as an example because I don't want to pander to individuals. I don't want to pander to industries. I mentioned Evergreen Solar and fad industries or the movie industry where we give special incentives. I want to create a rising tide across the state. What do I mean by this? Again, Kennedy said a rising tide floats all boats. Well, it floats all people. It floats all industries. It also floats all regions. So with regard to Cape Cod, I'm not going to do anything specific for Cape Cod. That's for your local selectmen. For example, Cape Cod, the seashore tourism versus the north shore of central mass, you have your own particular advantages that can draw businesses in. I can do those four things that I talked about, make Massachusetts business friendly, and float the regional boat. But at some point, people in the boat have to raise the anchor, right? set the sail, and take the helm. That's the point, and that's the job of local government. So I'm going to do something statewide, and local regions or local governments can make it advantageous for businesses, for people.